I'm Jonathan Wentworth. Uh, I'm with USDA ARS at Aberdeen. Uh, I'm a plant pathologist involved in this project for developing potato cyst nematode resistance in U.S. cultivars. Rich Novi is a potato breeder. He's also at Aberdeen. Um, Joe Cool is uh, involved with the project as well. He's up on campus. Um, Walter DeYoung is at Cornell, and he's a potato breeder. Um, so we'll go through. This is a, a sub-objective that we have as part of the Global Alliance uh, grant that involves many other scientists. Um, and when we get done today, I'll turn some, we'll turn some time over to Matt Morris, who is a University of Idaho researcher, and he's going to be talking about biofumigens. So the problem with potato cyst nematode, uh, I just wanted to make it very clear. Uh, you have a long-lived nematode in the soil when it insists. This is a juvenile right here of the pale cyst nematode, even though it's been lit up with this beautiful fluorescent dye. Um, but the problem is, is that the females uh, develop cysts on the roots, and these cysts can last for many decades, 30, 30 plus years in the soil until the right uh, hatching factor is present, which is a, a host crop such as potato. And left unchecked, this is the problem right here, where you can end up with an 80% yield loss without any uh, other controls. And the real problem is, is uh, yes, we have nematicides, and, but when you have a profit margin of so many dollars and you have a nematicide that costs what your profit margin was, then it's very difficult to raise potatoes. And so that's why this is one of the reasons why this is a quarantine pest. But just a short tutorial, uh, we're dealing with three species when we talk about PCN. Rostochiensis, which is golden cyst nematode, Pallida, which is the pale cyst nematode, and Globodera elantone, which is Claridoba Globodera elantone. So uh, we may have a contest later on for a name for that. This just shows the historical locations of potato cyst nematodes in North America. And we'll go from the most recent, which would be the Elantone discovered in Oregon in 2008, uh, also reported in Idaho, but not an exact location. Pale cyst nematode in 2006 in eastern Idaho, and golden nematode in southern Quebec in the same year. Um, and then going back further than that, uh, golden nematode in New York, which is under quarantine there as well, the R01 race in 1942 and the R02 race in 1968. And then you can see in Newfoundland, we have both golden and pale cyst nematode. Um, golden nematode here in southern British Columbia. And there's been a report of golden nematode in Alberta, although that's been very well looked at. And they, do, they have had cysts, um, but it's, there's no quarantine there at the present time. What I wanted to show you, and, and this is the unique opportunity that we have in this research project, is that We've got those locations where we know there's populations, but we have three nematologists where these uh, green stars are. Uh, in Moscow, we have uh, Louise Marie Danderan, who's also leading the grant. Uh, in Oregon, we have Inga Zasada, who's working with Ellen Tone. And then in New York, we have another ARS researcher, uh, Zhihong Wang, who's working with uh, Rosto Kansas. And so they have biosecure labs where they have these populations. And we have the opportunity as a breeding program to get some genetic resources together, get some advanced breeding lines, and send the same material out to all three locations and get some answers as to resistance for what we have in our breeding program. So what I, I wanted to show was this is a 1977 report by Evans and Stone. And this page is much longer, but this is the reported distribution of species of potato cyst nematodes. Um, the U.S. is included on this list, but this is table two, and this is table three, and this is countries that have a lot of potatoes. And the comment was, since potato cyst nematodes will inevitably continue to spread, any country listed in table three, right here, but not in table two must be at risk or harbor undetected infestations. Potato cyst nematode is very difficult to control, and, and that's why quarantine measures have been used in it, it's a severe measure, but that's, that's been the solution. So our work, we want to look at another solution. We want to develop some resistant varieties. Um, so again, we have this opportunity to screen against all three species, um, existing cultivars. We have some advanced breeding lines. Because our genetic base is fairly broad, 
we may already have some resistance in, we just haven't screened for it. And the idea would be that we'd be that much closer to release of a new variety. Um, but we also, with the information, can develop uh, the ability to look for resistant genes. And we have the opportunity to characterize this new species of Elantone. So this is a big chart, but it just shows you what we've done recently. And what I have is this shows the three species right here. And what we've done is this is a one to nine scale. Nine means that it's resistant. One means that it's very susceptible. And what, it, what we've compared them against is the susceptible. We've counted cysts in the pot or cysts on the root ball for these assays. And we've compared them to how many cysts in the pot or root ball that Desiree, a, a kind of universal susceptible, has. And then we've ranked them like this. So these are ranked against uh, Desiree. And this is good because this allows us to compare with results in the literature where Desiree is the universal control for that. And so then what I've done is, is just kind of ranked them here. And these are the ones that have the highest resistance to all three species. So this is just an average of that. But you can see the highest resistance we've found so far with, uh, against Pallida is a six, where we've got much higher resistance with Rostocansis. And here we're talking this resistance is because of a resistance gene. We don't have the same luxury with, with Pallida. Uh, it's more a, a continuum than, than resistant or not resistant. This shows uh, the ones that have some good resistance. And you can see in these varieties, there is a correlation between Rostocansis resistance and Elantone. So that's good news. Uh, but again, these are the higher. There's a six, there's a five uh, for these varieties. And then these are some of the breeding lines that we did. And you can see uh, we don't have the Pallida in these. These are some of the higher ones. The list is much longer. I just shortened it so we could actually see what's in the slide here. Um, and then here's Desiree. And Russet Burbank in, in the screenings we did actually had more cysts than Desiree did. But again, we're using Desiree as the control for developing the scale right here. So just to recap, in, in 41, golden nematode detected in New York and under quarantine. 2006, pale cyst nematode in Idaho, golden nematode again in another location in Canada, and Elantone detected in Idaho and Oregon. And prior to that, it, it is a big deal because pale cyst nematode had not been detected in North America. I'm sorry, in the USA. It was only known in, in Newfoundland and uh, British Columbia. So currently, uh, under quarantine, golden cyst nematode, acres infested, almost 6,000, regulated quite a bit more. And these are, we we're talking associated fields. Um, Quebec, almost 5,000 acres and regulated about 10,000. Pale cyst nematode, right around 3,000 in Idaho, uh, regulated almost 10,000. But again, these acres are included in these amounts right here. And at the present time, there's no quarantine for Elantone. Okay, so that, should we take questions as we go or should we just march through it? Um, I don't know what, audience have a preference? Uh, that's make a comment on that last slide if I may. 300,000 acres regulated in New York, only about 10,000 total are in potatoes. The rest is regulated land, but not farm, not survey, not potatoes. Okay. So we're, we're pairing that down with that first 10,000. Next, next several years. Yeah, so if I were to correct that, more correct would be 10,000. 10,000 10, acres of regulated potato fields. Wow, this is better than church. Everyone's in the front pews here. So. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna shy away from this microphone. It's a little bit limiting. So can you hear me back there okay? Okay, I'm just gonna put on my loud voice um, at this point. Um, I want to begin with an overview of PCN resistance. And this is not as in-depth as I would like, but we do have a short time to talk about this. But to begin with, there are over 14 loci, or sites, or genes, you might say, that are mapped to eight different chromosomes that have been identified associated with PCN resistance to one of, well, I should say to at least two of those species. Elantone is a relatively new species where there's not a whole lot known. And what I'm going to talk about today 
will shed some more light on El Antone and resistance as well, which is, uh, I think, pretty exciting, actually. Um, this resistance is derived from multiple uh, relatives of potato. Luckily, potato has a little over 100 wild relatives that are a source of uh, resistances that we can tap into. So far, there have been 14 uh, genes. Uh, I'm sure there's many more than that. Now, Rasta uh, Kansas are golden. As was talked about, um, that has been in the U.S., in New York, for quite a while, since the 1940s. There is a major gene, H1, that confers resistance, uh, complete resistance, to the primary pathotypes, row 1 and row 4. Now, that was a very durable resistance. Um, this came initially from Andigena and it mapped to chromosome 5, and marker, a uh, very strong marker, has been identified to aid in selection, where it's this marker closely associated with H1, okay? It's very good for a breeding program to have these molecular markers uh, in place. Now, I said it was durable, but there have been new pathotypes, row 2 as an example, that have developed, but nonetheless, a lot of the primary pathotypes, if you just have row 1 or 4, the H1 will still confer resistance uh, to those uh, pathotypes. Now, Alantone, like Jonathan was saying, that's a very recent discovery, okay? This is just discovered in 2008. So there isn't a whole lot known with regard to resistance to Alantone at this point, but from the screenings that have been conducted by uh, Inga and Louise Marie, there does appear to be an association. If, it, if rosochiensis resistance is present at high levels, then it appears that El Antone uh, resistance is also evident. So that's very exciting. I'm going to cover a little bit further um, the marker and the association as well with El Antone resistance. And that is some of Joe Cool's uh, slides, which I'll follow up on. For those of you who may not know, Joe didn't make it out of Lewiston last night, so um, I'll be presenting his slides too today. So the pale, this becomes a little bit more complicated uh, resistance. Uh, polygenic, I've talked to breeders in Europe who have dealt with Palida uh, to a greater duration than we have in the US. Um, there's a major con contributing resistance gene, GPA5, that came from Solanum vernii, which is a wild species from Argentina. And this does contribute a good level of resistance, but if you want the highest level, according to my discussions anyway, you need to have, um, there's at least two other additional genes to confer the highest level of resistance to Palina. So it's a combination of the three that are necessary for the higher levels of Palina resistance. So, not as clear-cut as uh, a major gene effect for Rosochiensis and maybe Elantone, Pallida, a little bit more difficult approach with at least three genes being involved. So the Aberdeen program, I'm going to talk about some of the breeding clones that we have utilized as parents already in our program and that have shown or are known to have uh, Pallida resistance. So from Europe, we have Sante from the Netherlands and Eden from UK. Um, we've also tapped, I know John Anderson, um, a colleague of mine who is a breeder in New Zealand. We've tapped a lot into the New Zealand breeding program with Moonlight, Karaka, and Bondi. South America, um, Joe Cool had identified Maria Huanca um, in terms of his uh, interactions with SIP. And we used that as a parent last year. Very prolific, a lot of flowers, and we'll see what the progeny uh, look like uh, coming out of that this coming year. And then New York 121 was brought into our program for its late blight resistance, even before Pallida was identified in Idaho. So that is what Jonathan talked about. We have a broad germplasm base. And so there may be within our germplasm right now that's advancing material that may have um, resistance. But this, we're on the fact-finding portion of it right now. But New York 121, first brought into our program for late blight resistance, fortuitously also has pallida resistance. And that's from Walter's uh, program there in Cornell. 
And then there are three other breeding clones at Aberdeen that have been through one series of evaluations for um, Pallida resistance by Louise Marie. Um, the second one um, has been completed and they're counting cysts at this point. We're sort of excited to see if these three might also again show what appears to be resistance to Pallida because these would be um, different sources of potential resistance, except for the NZA, which likely goes back to the New Zealand material, um, you know, probably Karaka. But nonetheless, we do have some hybrid breeding clones that look like they may have resistance to Pallida. We're also very interested in incorporating new material into our program, and so uh, John Pickup put me in touch with uh, Agrico, some of their, uh, the director there, Dr. Alefs, and we have obtained from him and in discussions with him, ambassador, basin resident, and performer, which we'll be using as parents. Um, they're already planned in the greenhouse. Beginning of March, April, we will be making hybridizations with them. And these uh, individuals have very high levels of resistance to Pallida. Arsenal and Alicante, um, we have requested they be imported and they're currently with APHIS. And these are just showing uh, what they look like at this point. And then we're also utilizing HCPC's innovator. Now we did have that as a parent in 2016. Um, we have a new greenhouse and ethylene will impact our flowering and there are some individuals that are more um, sensitive than others. Well, unfortunately, Innovator turned out to be one of them. So we have what we hope to have solved the problem with a little bit too high of ethylene in our new greenhouse. So we're going to reuse it again in uh, 2017. And then um, I have uh, colleagues from Germany, uh, Bernd uh, Truberg uh, with Norica. And I've requested some PCN resistance uh, from Germany as well, from Nautilus and Tokia. And those are currently imported and with APHIS as well. Now I want to back up what we've talked about so far with a few exceptions like Basin Russet or maybe Innovator. Most of the European material is not uh, a market class that would work well for us in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Pacific Northwest, we need the long type with russeting as preferable. Um, most of what the Europeans have are table stock, round oval, either white flesh if it's coming from the UK, um, from Netherlands, yellow flesh. So, you know, this is why we're bringing this material in and we'll be making hybridizations with material that fits better the market classes uh, for the Pacific Northwest. So, to give you a little primer, you're probably wondering, well, okay, you're bringing this material in. What's, what are these steps you're talking about? Well, this is a quick primer for potato breeding 101, you might say. But potatoes asexually propagate, everybody knows that. You cut the tuber, plant it, identical plants coming up. In potato breeding, luckily, potato still has flowers. It also can reproduce uh, sexually. And that's a benefit to us as potato breeders, as long as you have flowers, you can use them in hybridizations, okay? Now, you can't always use a parent as a male. About 50% of clones are sterile, male sterile. But if they flower, you can always pretty much use them as a female with success. If you're successful in the hybridization, you have what are called, uh, they look very much like tomato, un, you know, uh, unripe tomatoes. And those are potato fruits, okay? And what we work with from the breeding program in then is to extract true potato seed or botanical seed from those berries. We're keeping track of the parentage so we know exactly what the parentage is of that true potato seed um, as we go. And you would plant that like you would tomato seed. Germinating up, you have uh, small seedlings. We put them into individual pots and I say we because my crew is here and we are talking weeks on end of transplanting. Um, my crew is, we couldn't do it without him, so thank you guys. Um, the seedling tumor production then, you can see from that little seedling, this is just taken in December with our second winter crop, but you can see they turn into full-blown plants in these um, pots here. 
Um, so these little ones are each put in an individual pot and you have a full bulb plant there. We then harvest the seedling tubers that are produced underneath, okay? And so here is one of those pots where the vine's been removed and there are three what we call seedling tubers. We'll keep the largest. Oftentimes we'll distribute the others to other breeding programs in North America. And this is just a, a representation of a family. Um, each one of these tubers then could become a potential new variety. Okay, each one is genetically distinct. Even though they have the same parent, right away in potato you have immediate segregation. Okay, like your brothers and sisters, there's some similarities there, but you have a lot of differences. It's the same with uh, potato breeding. So these seedling tubers are packaged up, put in the cooler over the winter, and then they're planted. This coming spring we'll be planting some out, like we do annually, um, separated out about two and a half feet. This is compliments of Rhett Spear. He brought a drone out during our single hill selection this past fall. And you can see we have a two row digger that's digging and laying out all these uh, single hills. And we go along and select from those for primarily agronomic uh, attributes at that point. Anything we select, second field year goes in from a single hill into a 12 hill now. Okay, so you have a 12 hill plot we're evaluating. And if it's selected in the second field year, the third field year it goes into a replicated field trial. Now this is very important because we're having to um, compare and compile data and compare against standard varieties. You can't just say, oh, we have a new variety. I mean, industry's gonna, they wanna know how it compares to Russell Burbank Ranger as example. So it takes many years of replicated trials to compile the data and to show the benefit uh, that is associated with a newer breeding clone or variety. And from that then, with that replicated data, feedback from industry, we have a new variety from that. So this is just a summary of our PCM breeding efforts in 2016. Uh, last year, we, in our hybridizations, developed 32 families for a total of almost 26,000 true potato seed. Our, our total to date, um, since we've started breeding for potato cysts nematode resistance, we have 139 families representing about 125,000 true potato seed. Um, one of the populations we developed too is this A10915, which is Eden, which is palatal resistant by Western Russet, which is not. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in Joe's slides as well. So the seedling tumors I talked about um, that we generated in 2016 that have PCN uh, resistance in their background. There are 52 families, totaling 9,287 seedling tubers. Those will be planted out now this coming spring. And this past year then, what we had planted out in the field as first field generation single hills, we had 26 families, about uh, almost 4,500 planted and 96 were selected based upon our evaluations in the field. And currently we have four clones of PCN resistant parentage, which we still need to verify as having um, resistance to PCN, but it has, does have the agronomics for advancement to replicate field trials at this point. And we're continuing with working with uh, Inga and uh, Louise Marie on the screening of breeding clones. And we'll be very excited to see what uh, the latest is with the uh, January assessments for uh, CIS numbers. All right, I'm going to move to Joe Cool's slides now. And he started with this one. I think he was wanting to show Eden, which was in Jonathan's slide here, having a uh, you know, pretty high levels of resistance to all three PCN, a little bit lower on the palate side. And this is that uh, population that we generate at Aberdeen, eaten by Western Russet. And the first 99 progeny of that have been screened against Elantone, and it has been screened against Palata at this point. And he's also looked at him for the presence of the H1 marker which is associated with Rostokiensis resistance, or golden nematode resistance. The second 99 progeny are in progress with G. pallida screenings. 
And so there's a total of 224 progeny that he, Joe has put into tissue culture from true potato seed. We sent him. He sent it back to us. This is a shot in our greenhouse right now of those clones. What we're going to do is, based on the screening, we're also going to look at them agronomically in the field. And based on the screenings, um, also select those individuals with better agronomics that appear to have good uh, PCN resistance as well. So we're generating uh, tubers at this point. What Joe has found, when he looked at the H1 gene, um, he's found a good correlation uh, between that H1 gene and resistance to Elantone, which is very good news because that um, is a much easier resistance to work with than, for example, with Palida, which I talked about is at least three genes being involved. So here is Western Russet from this family, one of the parents. It doesn't have the H1 gene uh, present based on the marker. Uh, if it was there, there would be an association. Eden does have that um, H1 gene based on the marker. And then you have individuals, if you look down, that with the presence of the marker, generally what you find is no um, Elantone being present. Okay, where you have an absence of that marker and then therefore H1, you can see you have higher levels of the cyst being produced. So that's very good news. We have a little bit more information on Elantone if that does become more of an issue in the West. That H1, the gene does appear to confer resistance to Elantone. So there's a high correlation between the H1, that 57R marker, and Elantone resistance. And um, there are a few discrepancies he wants to look at to see if crossing over maybe has occurred, breaking the linkage between the H1 marker um, between H1 and the marker associated with it. But overall, it looks like a strong association. Okay, he's also looked at other molecular markers and applied it to this population. And so, again, remember the population, the parents are Eden and Western Russet, and these are some of the progeny from that. Now, he also has Russet Burbank Innovator and a differential present as well. And he's screened against... Um, with markers for three different genes, GPAW4, GPAW5 are for Pallida resistance, and then the H1 gene, which I talked about, which is Rostokiensis, and may confer resistance to Elantone as well. And as you can see, it's interesting. Eden um, appears to have this GPAW4, but does not have the GPAW5 marker, okay? And that is the one that seems to confer a higher level of Pallida resistance. So that, that was an interesting finding. For example, you'll see Innovator, which um, I think we all would consider to have higher resistance than Eden. It does have this GPAW5. So, you know, it would seem to indicate this GPAW4, however, still has a pretty good contribution of resistance to Pallida, even without the presence of the GPAW5. Um, and as you can see, as you go through, there's segregation for, um, obviously, no segregation here. Um, this is the innovator just showing it has it. But for this gene, it's segregating in the progeny of Western Russet by Eden. And when you look over here for the H1 gene, you're also getting segregation, although it looks like it's pretty strong coming through in most of the progeny. You seem to have the H1 uh, marker and the associated gene. So that, that is uh, what he was trying to show on this slide. So a continuous distribu distribution for G palatin resistance. Um, the population segregate for a GPAW4 indigenous marker. And so he screened 40 progeny uh, with this marker, and they're needing to analyze the next results with G palatin. They've extracted DNA from the over 200 progeny, and we're sending 31 of those for a potato SNP analysis, which is a different type of molecular marker type analysis. Can be very quick and intensive with a lot of markers looked at in a very quick manner. And that's to verify parental contribution. So ongoing research, uh, Joe had in his slide, uh, continuing to map a uh, population of 200 plus from that family. And plants will be genotyped with over 20,000 plus SNPs. Okay, those are those molecular markers trying to identify additional 
um, resistance genes besides the GPA4, perhaps that might be contributing to resistance. And continuing uh, phenotyping against Pallida with cysts and egg counts. And to plug the marker data he gets from the SIPs, uh, the SNPs, I'm sorry, and put that in the tetraploy map to try to find associations between the SNP markers and uh, Pallida resistant. And that is it, I believe. So um, I thank you for your attention. And Jonathan and I can answer any questions there might be. And I think we left enough time for Matt yet. So yeah. any uh, questions? Yeah. I have a question. I don't know whether which one of you can answer it, but um, in your map you showed that the nematodes in the northern part of the United States there are no no problems with nematodes in the south, where there are no crops that are susceptible to nematodes. Um, Jonathan? I just, that's a very good question. Yeah, I, I just went specifically on reports for the potato cyst nematode. Um, Louise Marie, do you have any other ideas? Well, I think that basically the risk for potato cyst nematode is where potatoes are grown, which right. is in the northern parts of the United States. It happens to be in two states in the U.S., uh, Rostock, Kansas, and New York, and Palada here in Idaho. So, so, so really, I missed the first part of your talk. Yeah. So I didn't see that map, but that would probably be the rationale for it. You're just asking other associated crops. Yeah, other associated yeah. crops. That <coughs> cyst oh, oh, so, so yeah. potato cyst nematode, the post for potato cyst nematode are potatoes. Uh, the, uh, the goat on the tomato is the as well, and uh, eggplant, peppers, but primary host is potato. So it does not have a wide host range like uh, some of the root knot nematodes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was, I was just looking for nematode problems and the only problems we have are in the north. Well, like Louise Marie said, most of your acreage is more to the north, and there's probably a little bit more greater scrutiny in potato production areas than you might have down in the smaller acreage in California or Texas, as an example. They, they yeah. still do look. Yeah, they, they I'm sure they do. They've been looking for yeah. years since uh, you know, Kansas was present. So right. they, they do look in those areas. They look in North Carolina. And they're looking for cyst nematodes anyway. They're looking for soybean cyst nematodes. They're other nematode problems like the root knot nematodes and what and root knot is obviously much worse down south. They grow potatoes in, in a number of states. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the production, especially seed production, is in 26 states, I believe. But there's a lot of production in North Carolina and in Florida, and they winter grow out in Florida and Hawaii for, for virus testing. And, so good. So I guess I didn't really answer your question why they are really showing up in the southern locales more. But that's good. We have enough on our plate. <laughs> yeah. So is the intention once you identify that successful PCN resistant clone to return some of those regulated acres to production? Um what the idea would be, and there was discussion in our global cap too during the advisory, but um, yeah, I mean, hopefully if we did have a PCN resistant clone with a high enough level of resistance, you know, potentially it could be part of a rotational crop. Um, from what I heard, you wouldn't want to plant it. You would want to have, a, you know, plant it successive, successively, but you would want to put in rotation, I guess, from what I hear anyway, with more of a susceptible, you know, every third year or something like that, <coughs> just so you don't have a buildup. But that, that would be the idea, um, is why we're moving towards that, is to give a, you know, alternative to those that do have uh, infestations currently. Excellent. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Great. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Lodicos and Pinos. Do you think that the system of show up in the field and the field in the field? We're with the markers that are involved, um, at least with H1, there's a strong correlation there. Um, with Pallida, um, I would say there's an HC marker that's associated with that GPOP5. And my understanding is that's, that's a pretty good indicator of Pallida resistance. So if we can start bringing the, together the markers we have um, with GPA5 and GPA4, <clears throat> I think we could start uh, bringing together and pyramiding the resistances. You know, um, 
Well, that, that would be a good question because <clears throat> obviously, you know, with the restrictions, I mean, ideally it would be nice to be able to eventually test these in the field under the areas that are currently, uh, you know, in, under APHIS's uh, jurisdiction. Um, whether that would be able to occur, I don't know. <clears throat> You know, at this point, the best we can do is screen um, in the greenhouses where we have biosafety levels adequate for empowerment. I'd, I'd say the example that you saw with, with resistance rust or rust there, there are a lot of varieties that can now be grown in New York and they can be grown in the Portland area <coughs> that have the H1 gene. Jonathan, I'm just... There are, there are H1 varieties that can be grown in the quarantine area and that resistance is held up, correct? So that's, that would just be an example of, yeah, we saw it in this, it's been shown in the screen, or in the bioassay in the greenhouse, and it also <coughs> transfers to the field. But ideally, yeah, compared to that would be where you would want to move towards is take your greenhouse screens and eventually have some type of field evaluations. Or maybe we can work with our European counterparts. So. <laughs> yeah, that would be the other alternative. Just to clarify, now, did you pop five minutes for the palliative? And you're showing more resistance for palliative for that one. Did you pop five is probably among the stronger of those genes for conferring um, resistance to, to palliative. And that one is from uh, Vernii. The GPOF4 is from uh, subspecies T. Uh, <coughs> uh Andigena. So different sources uh, of, uh, of those resistance genes, which is good, actually. That's Plus what you want. A cross between Eden and Innovator with potential capture. Right. Sure, that's so all that's kind of a well. Yeah, exactly. Well. <coughs> Although Innovator already has very high levels of uh, Palada resistance. So, um, on that scale, I think Palada 2, it's a uh, 9. I think Palada 3, so. So that's, that's a very high level already in the new Yeah. All right. All right, well, thanks for your attention. <laughs>